Uh-oh. <laughs> the unintentional consequences. <laughs> I don't know if you were at home as the children were going out, we heard, I'm running away. <laughs> So I will invite you to just take a deep breath and maybe look at your neighbor who's sitting next to you, okay? Be aware of each other and let us pray. Whichever way you turn, whichever way you Whichever way you turn, there is the face of God. Whichever way you turn, whichever way you turn, whichever way you turn, there is the face of of God. So I'm inviting you to a call and response in the sermon today. So when I say, where then can we flee from your spirit? You say, you've got to remember this, O oh, loving God, you are there. Let's just practice. O oh, loving God, you are there. I say, where then can we flee from your spirit? O loving God, you are there. One more time. Where then can we flee from your spirit? O loving God, you are there. Thank you. Beautiful. Sort of like a choir. You get to do that today. When I was a graduate student in Chicago, one of my best friends was a musician named Angela. We sang together. She played 12-string guitar, and she wrote beautiful, haunting songs. One summer, we attended a hot outdoor music festival in the street, and, you know, they stopped the traffic. There were just masses of people. I remember the enticing aroma of different ethnic foods, all varieties of music, Saxophones were wailing, keyboards jangling, people singing and dancing. <clears throat> the atmosphere was that of a joyous carnival. And I can still picture Angela turning to me and saying, I wish life could always be like this. I'm in heaven. <laughs> if I climb up to heaven, O oh God, you were there. Where then can we flee from your spirit? Yes. Probably we can, many of us think about joyful experiences of contentment and bliss and joy. And it's, it's fairly easy to think of God being in that experience. But sometimes when things are going so well, when we've achieved something, when we feel like we're doing just fine, we may actually forget that we need God. We're all handling it very well, thank you. In contentment, we may forget God. But it's also difficult to trust when life hurts. So this morning we have a parable from Matthew where things are not going well for the farmer. You would think after sowing the seeds and watering that, you know, pretty well down the road of accomplishment, but an enemy sows weed seeds. The story suggests that in that confusing mess, sometimes we simply have to wait for the outcome to be able to sort things through. Sometimes in our looking back, we could recognize God was there. When we are in the thick of things, especially in the throes of loss and chaos, seeing God can elude us, and we just have to wait and trust. 
But over a thousand years before that parable was told by Jesus, we have the psalmist who wrote Psalm 139, noting that we are so intimately loved by God, there is no place that we can go and no situation that God is not. Where can we go from God's presence? <laughs> Thank you, I didn't write that in, and you're on it. <laughs> we can lightly, I would imagine that you can help me think of a lot of different circumstances where we wonder if God is there. The chaos of war, the furnace of climate change, the emptiness of separation and divorce, in the murkiness of memory loss, in the trial of waiting for medical results, in the slow drip of changes that accompany growing older, in the insanity of bigotry, and in the uncertainty of a changing world, where then can we flee from the Spirit? O oh, loving God, you are there. So some of us are challenged with trusting that God really is with us, especially if we had an early childhood experience of a parent who was dysfunctional or distant or abusive. It's very, very difficult to have this feeling of trust. For others, or maybe even the same, the intellectual leap from, you know, you can assent to divinity connected to the Big Bang and evolution, but a God who's really paying attention to every one of us, that just doesn't add up. Psalm 139 may be tough to resonate with, but consider this. If I make the grave my bed, you are there also. If I make the grave my bed, you are there. I have found over the years that frequently people come to church when they are dealing with mortality, whether it's a loved one or their own health and threat to their life. Um, it is often to the church that people come for guidance. But that grave as bed has a particular significance in Psalm 139. The word that is translated grave in Hebrew is Sheol, and it's not the fiery afterlife that we saw hinted at in the parable today. Sheol is a place of nothingness, a place where every mortal creature, all animals, all people, are dust. Just as we came from dust, we go back to dust. Author Ursula Le Guin you probably, some of you have probably read her work, in the Earthsea Trilogy wrote of the land of the dead that is a great description of Sheol. There is no passing of time there. No wind blew and the stars did not move. The houses had windows that were never lit and in certain doorways were standing with quiet faces and empty hands the dead. The dead stood still or moved slowly and with no purpose. There was in their shadowed eyes no hope. At times in life, our mental and spiritual weariness may feel like shale. Where then can we flee from the spirit? So if we are struggling with a sense, lacking that sense of God's presence, what can we do to cultivate a deeper trust? We have a God whose love is stronger than death. It's unshakable. That love keeps calling us back to the right path, 
And that love gives us strength to change because we are children of God. One way to deepen our trust is to cultivate a regular spiritual discipline. Just as we cultivate physical exercise and a healthy diet, so cultivating a healthy spiritual practice requires practice. Daily prayer, meditation, reading the Bible or other spiritual books. Some of us like to move, to dance or do qigong or tai chi. Some of you went and walked the labyrinth yesterday, right, Linda? Where are you? I think a few of you, yes, you went to the labyrinth. And that's another spiritual practice. Being able to do this regularly, writing in a journal, praying with a friend, and I'll, did I say dancing? <laughs> All of these and many other practices can cultivate a deeper trust in God. But another important thing is the accompaniment, support, and encouragement of our community of faith. You know, the word liturgy means the work of the people. But it's not just liturgy that happens in the sanctuary here or in the sanctuary of the firs. The liturgy is the work of the people all the time. The work on reconciling Reconciling in Christ, um, reckoning with racism, volunteering to teach English to immigrants, visiting the sick, bringing communion, offering donations for world relief, providing a space for Head Start children this fall. Our service together, our work on council, our work on committee, our quilting together, our service together and friendships form our liturgy. And being connected with other people in that love greater than ourselves can deepen our faith. So regular spiritual discipline, encouragement and support and accountability of communion are ways to deepen our trust in God. But there's also a necessary letting go. When I was back in seminary a long time ago, I remember a workshop with the Episcopal priest, Morton Kelsey. He was also a writer. And he, his message over and over and over again was that we live in two worlds. The physical world of matter and things and schedules and time and people that's the physical world we measure, we can see, we experience. But there is also an inner world. This is the world that we see in the Bible, oftentimes. An inner world where we can be met and touched and changed by God. It's really interesting, this world of images and imagination and dreams, it's interesting that even ministers don't talk much about this. Um, it's not measurable. It's not scientific. It's not proven. But as Carl Jung said, no one can logically prove the existence of an elephant. You just have to go and experience one. So it is with our inner world and experience of God. The psalmist knew that inner world, so much so the psalmist could not imagine any place where God is not. That inner world often does become significant when we are around those who are dying or we are nearing death ourselves. I want to close by sharing a story of mine from 30 years ago. It's one of the stories experiences that helped open my heart and mind to inner experiences. So, amazingly, 30 years ago this month, I did my first memorial service as a pastor. Clarence, the man who died, 
was not a member of my church, but his two adult daughters came to me and wanted me to do the service and shared about his life. I was very anxious about getting it right, not just because I'm a perfectionist, but it is a very big honor to be with people at that point in their life and loss, and I didn't want what I said to be inauthentic or violating the spirit of Clarence, who I had never met. Those daughters spent about an hour or so with me describing Clarence, his strengths, his weaknesses, his life experience. But one of the most memorable things was that Clarence loved trains. He loved trains when he was a boy. He loved trains when he was a man. He collected them. He put tracks together. And he had a lifelong dream of living in a caboose and traveling the world. I really felt good after that conversation because I felt like I had a sense of him. I was still nervous, though, about the service. And the night before the memorial service, I had one of those dreams that was so vivid, it seems real. Do you know what I'm talking about? The colors are bright, and you wake up like, wow, did that happen? What I dreamed was, I was in a red caboose, <laughs> and we were among these beautiful green, lush hills, and in the red caboose with me was a little boy in denim overalls with freckles and a big, mischievous grin. His energy was vibrant and his smile infectious. And when I woke up, I thought, I met Clarence. Where then can we flee from the Spirit? On this Sunday, our nodders, our nifty nodders, provided the high school graduates with a wonderful symbol of God's enduring presence and love. Let's all imagine right now what a handmade quilt with love and community wrapping around us feels like when we are in the land of shale. May we all know with all our hearts that God is with us every minute of every hour. May we remember Jesus' unshakable love Oh, where then can we flee from the Spirit?